As of today, Nelson Laboratories has launched a new and improved website. Please go and check it out. The new features, such as our Knowledge Center section featuring a blog, Compliance Corner, Resources, and Education pages. Many other valuable resources are now available to you. If you miss one of our webinars or would like to refer back to one, you can always find them on the archived webinars page under the Knowledge Center of our website shortly after the webinars. We also welcome your questions. You can submit questions at any time during the webinar. Thor will randomly answer as many as possible during our last 15 minutes. We ask that if you have a product-specific question, you write it down, save it, and contact Thor about it after the webinar. You can reach Thor directly at 801-290-7832 or email trollins at nelsonlabs.com. Now let me welcome and tell you a little bit about Thor. He is the in vivo biocompatibility section leader at Nelson Laboratories. Thor is a registered microbiologist with the National Registry of Certified Microbiologists who specializes in the in vitro and in vivo biocompatibility tests. He is also a participating member on all of the ISO 10993 committees. Thor earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Idaho State University and has been with Nelson Laboratories since 2002. Welcome, Thor. The time is now yours. Thank you, Mike. I uh, hope that everyone can hear me. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with uh, the big three. And the reason why I wanted to call this the big three was um, uh, we, we are looking here at a bunch of biocompatibility tests. And depending on your device and its contact type and duration, you might have to do multiple, multiple of these tests, but there's one constant no matter if you're a Band-Aid or a permanent implant, and that's cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation. So that's why we call these the big three tests. They're the three tests that everyone uh, has to hear. So everyone has to do. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about a, a little bit uh, uh, for all these tests are the difference between a direct contact test and an extraction test. So for this, I've given these pictures to try to help demonstrate a little bit more about these tests. Um, the right here, as you can see, uh, we have a sample that's in direct contact with the test system. So even though this isn't a biocompatibility test, it's a good representation of the, the type of test that we go for for direct contact, where the sample is placed directly onto the test system. So that could be an animal, if we're doing an animal test, or it could be the, the cells or bacteria or if we're doing a, an in vitro test. But the important concept here is that the device itself is placed onto the test system, where an extraction test is where we take your sample and we immerse it in some type of media. Uh, it, it's a media that will leach out possible toxins into that media. And then we take that media and we put it onto the test system. So it's kind of an indirect test where we take the sample and we extract it, and then we use that extract to put in the test. The, how to choose what test to run kind of depends on the device that you have. So if you have a pure skin contacting device, then you want to use the direct contact version because that mimics more of a, of a skin contact. It's less sensitive, and so if you have, let's say, you know, something Velcro or something along those lines with a lot of surface area, that kind of helps take away that aspect of the test. With the extraction version, this is for devices that have body fluid contact, something that could be exchanging with the body um, and is considered more sensitive by rule. So these are devices that have wound contact, um, blood contact, really anything that's not skin contacting. And if there's a question or a gray area between your device, if it's a skin or, or fluid contact, then please go with the extraction method. Like I mentioned before, it's considered worst case, so uh, you're probably safer justifying that test over the direct if you have any questions. So um, right here is I, I've basically given the extraction versions of this test. So we're looking at the MEM elution for the cytotoxicity test, um, the 
ma uh, maximum calignin or the LLNA for the sensitization. And then for the irritation, we're looking at intercutaneous reactivity. So that's just the versions of uh, the, the extraction versions of these tests. Here are the direct contact versions of the test. Once again, if you have a skin contact uh, device, this is the test that you want to choose. Auger overlay for the cytotox, Bueller uh, closed patch method, uh, and a primary skin uh, or the specific irritation contact area. So just give you some idea of testing that you can choose depending on the type of test you want to run, direct or indirect. So um, here is a sample preparation. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the sample prep and uh, how that might impact. I'm getting some questions through or some things about the phones being quiet, so I'm going to try my handset uh, to see if that's a little louder. Uh, one second. I'm hoping that this is a better uh, connection for you guys. Um, so if it's not, please let me know. So with sample preparation, we want to look at, uh, first off, the surface area versus weight. OK, great. This is much better. Thank you. Um, so we have to look at surface area versus weight for all these types of tests. The reason why is because the ISO 10993-1 um, and dash 12 look at how we prepare your sample. So they give us a ratio of surface area to volume or weight to volume depending on your device. The more surface area, the more volume of extraction media we can add. The more weight, the more volume of extraction we can add. So the first question is, which one is right for my product? Now, there has been some shift recently in the regulatory agencies on which one is preferred. Uh, surface area has always been preferred according to ISO, but if you had a very complex device, uh, you could justify weight pretty easily in the past. That is no longer the case. Um, recently, if you use weight as a, as a ratio of your device to volume, you have to be prepared to justify why you did so um, to the regulatory agency you're submitting to. Uh, most of the time, weight is a better case test. Um, especially with dense materials, metals or very thick plastics, you're going to get much more volume of media per device by weight than you would by surface area. So keep that in mind, um, and if all possible, use surface area as a ratio of determining how much sample you need. The, 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 oper the, the reasons to use weight would be, for example, uh, pellets or powders, um, or something I mentioned Velcro before, something that has such a huge amount of surface area that's very difficult to measure. Uh, weight would be uh, a worst case scenario in that, in that circumstance, so we can justify why using weight. With thickness, this, uh, it does matter with surface area, so that's important to keep in mind. The ISO gives us a ratio of surface area to volume based on the thickness, and that thickness is 0 0.5 millimeters. That's the decision point. So if your sample is 0.5 millimeters or less, we actually need twice as much sample than we would if it's greater than 0.5 millimeters in, in thickness. So if you have a sample that's greater than 0.5 millimeters, then you can actually get away with half the amount of sample for the test, and that's very beneficial. The, um, so keep that in mind. Really try to uh, think about surface area. Contact the lab uh, that you're testing with. Uh, beforehand to try to work through those surface area issues with them to make sure that you, uh, you know, can get the right uh, number of samples for the test. And that gets us to the next question, can I give the lab the surface area? Uh, we highly recommend this. Uh, even though we are kind of science geeks and we love to deal with, with calculators and calipers, in reality it's very difficult for us to take some of these devices on the workbench and use those uh, primitive tools to come up with a very accurate surface area. In fact, most of the time we so under-exaggerate the surface area that it's a much less worst case. So if you have a CAD drawing or other engineering tool or some really good engineers that come up with a very good surface area calculation for us, I mean, we can kind of uh, you know, validate that for you by, by confirming it, but please give us that. We're more than happy to go from that end instead of starting from scratch. And the last one I always get when it deals with uh, surface area weight is if I change, you know, how that would change my results. Um, if you have two labs that are doing testing for you or uh, years ago you did a test and now you're looking at redoing them, 
Um, if you did one by weight and one by surface area, most of the time you're going to have difference in results. Um, that's why the surface area is preferred. So just keep that in mind if you're investigating failures or differences between uh, different labs or tests. The last thing we have to talk about with sample preparation is extraction time and temperature. So remember with the extraction version of these tests, we determine the amount of volume that we need based on surface area weight to put your sample in as far as fluid. Then we have to extract it. And that extract is, is meant to bring out leachables into the solution. Now, obviously, the higher the, the temperature, the worst case scenario. So these are the ISO uh, extraction times and parameters. Uh, 37 degrees for 24 hours is just for the cytotoxicity test. So that's the only test that we can really use this extraction time and temperature. The rest of these are for the other um, ISO tests. And I'll explain a little bit in a second why we use this temperature in the, um, in the uh, cytotoxicity. This is another update from regulatory um, as far as the temperature used. In the past, we used to you know, really leave it up to the sponsor of what temperature to use. But usually, the 37 was the most common te extraction temperature we saw because it mimics body temperature. And most of these devices are not meant to go into very hot places of the body. I mean, a 50 degrees, if a body has 50 degrees, I think has other problems than your medical device. But in reality, the, the thought process now from the regulatory agencies are ex exaggerated extractions. So if your device has longer than 72-hour contact in the body, then you're going to have to look at doing a 50-degree or higher extract. The reason, the thought behind that is if you have longer than 72 hours, then you're actually getting a worse case exposure in the body than what we're testing for. So just doing a 37 for 72, if your, body is, if your device is a permanent implant, then that implant's going to be in the body for years at 37 and not just 72 hours. So by increasing the temperature to 50 degrees, we exaggerate that extraction, and we can more mimic the type of dose that the, of leachables that your body's going to see at a lifetime of um, contact. So I would be cautious of going above 50 unless you have a very heat-soluble device, um, or heat-stable device, excuse me. Um, in this case, you know, if we go to 70 degrees, we might be changing the device so much that uh, we'd have a big impact. So keep that in mind. Uh, if it's greater than 72-hour contact, choose 50 degrees. Anything less than 72 hours, you're probably still safe at 37, but it never hurts going to 50. So the first test we're going to contact or talk about in this uh, big three are the cytotoxicity. And, and this is probably the test that uh, is going to be the most uh, information for you because uh, it's going to be your best friend and your worst enemy sometime during your, uh, during your um, uh, time here. Uh, the question was where those, I had a question about uh, those temperatures. They were in Celsius. So um, that 37 degrees Celsius. So um, for the cytotoxicity, we have these three contacts, once, or these three tests based on contract, uh, contacts. The MEM elution is the extraction version of the test. And then the auger overlay and direct contact are the um, uh, direct versions of the test. These are some of our tools of the trade. So up here is our cell culture flasks. This is what we grow our cells in. The uh, cytotoxicity is done on a cell line called L929. They're mouse fibroblast cells. Uh, there's a couple of reason we reasons we use these cells. Um, one is they're historically the cells that are used for the cytotox. So the results given from these cells are comparable to you know, many submissions, very comfortable with the FDA. Highly recommend using the L929 cells in your cytotoxicity tests. Um, and another reason is because these cells are hearing, which means they, they stick. And uh, these cells will actually stick to the bottom of these plates right here and grow. And so we harvest them or grow them up in these flasks. And then we break them apart and put them into these little six-well plates. In these plates, this is where we'll put the extraction fluid of your, of your device onto these cells. And then we basically look for cell health uh, after they has been in contact with that extraction fluid. So this is um, the extraction uh, solvents that we can use according to ISO. Uh, the most common is vegetable oil and saline. We have to look at both the polar and nonpolar uh, options for these extractions. 
This is important because the body is just not made up of saline or, or water. We have oils, you know, uh, skin exudes oils, and we have serum in our body. All these different nonpolar also. And if anyone's tried to mix, uh, you know, oil and water or uh, any kind of, um, you know, nonpolar or polar mixture, you know that this don't mix very well. Well, there are leachables on your device that are both uh, polar. Uh, that will be drawn off with polar and nonpolar medias. So. We are looking at these types of extractions to, admit, to draw out all the possible leachables on your device, those that will be drawn out with oil and those that will be drawn off with, with saline or water. As you notice, though, the reason why this is a cytotoxicity, at the bottom we have both culture medium as a polar and nonpolar option. This is the only test uh, that, besides the material media pyrogen, which we won't talk about, in the biocompatibility regime that actually uses uh, one extraction media. The reason why is none of these other uh, vegetable oil or PEG or DMSO, they're, they're all very toxic to cells by themselves. So if we extract in these medias, we'll have to dilute them out so much that really we're not looking at a good test. So the culture medium is by and large a polar media, but we do add 5% bovine serum to the, um, to the culture medium to give us that nonpolar additive. So even though it's only 5%, it still gives us some of that nonpolar um, extraction uh, to be able to draw out those lipophilic uh, substances. So we have to use caps, uh, culture medium for both the polar and nonpolar for the cytotoxicity. Um, the cell line, and someone asked to repeat the cell line for the cytotox, it's L929. It's mouse fibroblast cells. So, so here's uh, some of the the, the benefits of the cytotoxicity test, and you can kind of see this on this chart. The, our history has shown that the cytotoxicity test is 90% of the time the test you're going to fail. So what we did is we looked up the failures over the last five years, and we looked at what test failed the most. And nine times out of ten, if you're going to fail a test, it's going to fail on the cytotoxicity. So that might sound like a bad thing, but in reality, it's a good thing. One, because the CYTO test is by far the cheapest and quickest test. Uh, you know, our, here at Nelson, our, our CYTO talks, we, we can get results in five days, and it costs like $130 for non-GLP non test. So you can run this test on your raw materials, on your, on your processes, and being so sensitive, you can actually start your file device with assurance that your material is safe. Um, I also want to kind of put in here uh, a little tidbit about USP class 6, and it'll just be really fast, but a lot of people look for materials that are USP class 6 certified, um, which is great, um, and it, that means they're safe materials to put into your device. But keep in mind that USP class 6 does not include a cytotoxicity test. And I just mentioned that the cyto test is the most sensitive test. So um, a lot of people will be surprised when they fail the cyto test because they have included USB class 6 materials in, in all their device. But once again, that doesn't have a cytotox. So when you're looking at materials, try to find one that has cytotoxicity done on it. If not, just run a quick cyto test on the raw material to be sure. Uh, like I said, very quick uh, and very sensitive. Um, some of the usual problems we'll see in this test, uh, latex and natural rubber, uh, we actually use for positive controls. So if you're using latex gloves in your manufacturing or process, and you might want to think about changing. Um, some of the metals also cause problems, silver, copper, zinc, um, dark inks. Most of the dark inks are actually made up of silver, copper, or along those lines. So uh, if they're not cured all the way, they'll be leaching those off. And um, short curing times and other things uh, also. So uh, it, you're looking at adhesives, paints, inks, those things. If they're not cured all the way, uh, if the catalyst has been removed from the apostasizer, things like that, that will show up in the cytotoxicity test. So this is the grading scale of the cytotoxicity test. And uh, this has recently been updated in the new ISO 10993-5. So the used to be a different scale from ISO and USP uh, standards. Now they both have the exact same scale. So you can pretty much follow this um, scale for all your testing. So it's of 0 to 4. And uh, here's the percentages of uh, biocompatibility or cytotoxicity that we look for. So a 0 is no cytotoxicity whatsoever. 
Uh, a one is less than 20% of the cells are toxic. A two is between 20 and 50% of the cells are toxic. Uh, a three is between 50 and 70% of the cells are affected in some way. And then if any of the over 70% of the cells are, are affected, then that's a four. Um, acceptance criteria for this test is two or less. So if you score zero, one, or two, you can pass the test. Three or four is considered a failure. Um, as you notice, you can actually have up to 50% of the cells in some way affected and still pass the test. Uh, that just shows how sensitive this test is compared to um, you know, some of the other tests that we allow up to half the cells to be affected. So um, I wanted to kind of give you an idea what we look for. It's much easier to have cells here um, that we can show. So some of the signs we look for um, are the, the health of the cells in general. So we look for how confluent the cells are. So we look to see if they're covering the bottom of the plate. Um, are they attaching well? They want to form these mosaic patterns. Uh, we also look for uh, a staining, which is called neutral red. It's called a viable stain, but that just means that healthy cells will bring that into their, their cell membranes. So we want to see that red inside the cells. So that's another indication. Um, I had a question that just recent, just right now, that says, are the cells individually counted? Um, no, what, what we do is we look at the cells that show an effect compared to the cells that don't, and then do a, a percentage. So um, it's more of a visual percentage of how many cells are affected compared to those that aren't. So in this case, this is a zero, because all the cells are healthy, they're covering the bottom of the plate, and they're fine. Um, this is compared to our positive control, which is much different. In fact, I'm going to kind of go in between a little bit so you can see the differences. So once again, this is a zero. Uh, you can see the cells are well-defined and covering the bottom of the plate. And then this is our, our positive. So the stain here, it, once again, is the neutral red stain. Um, and, and that's just neutral red. Um, and that stain has been stained on these cells also. But as you can see, there's no stain inside. And to be honest, these things on the bottom that look like cells, they're actually the fiber of the cell left behind. This is a latex. A uh, latex actually fixes the cells to the bottom of the plate. So you can uh, see basically the skeletons on the bottom of the plate. Um, this cell down here has a little bit of red in it. It does look like it might be hanging on. But it has something we call granules, which are these dirty little uh, protein matrices inside the cell. So um, obviously, though, that cell is not great. So this is a complete um, destruction. So this test is the MEM elution test. This is the extraction version. But we also look for the same things in the auger overlay. So this, these cells will be representative of all the cytotoxicity tests. So we want to kind of get an idea of the cell health based on um, how we stain them, how they look, things like that. Um, a, good tox or a good cytotoxicologist would be able to actually give you a hint of what kind of uh, toxicity we're looking at. Because we see so many cells and we, we know the difference between a latex burn, for example, this one, or chemical, or things like that, uh, if you get a good cytotoxicity uh, uh, technician, they'll be able to give you a good indication of why you're failing. Uh, you might not, we won't be able to tell you exactly what it is, but at least we're to investigate. So I just had a question of what is MEM? Um, MEM stands for Minimal Essential Media. And uh, what it is, it's the fluid we use to extract in, that serum, that uh, serum and uh, culture medium that I mentioned before. Uh, and it's just a, a media that we use to mimic what the body gives the cells. So it just gives the, the cells the minimally essential nutrients they need to grow. And so the test is named after that type of media we use. So the next test we're going to hit is for hypersensitivity, and it's called sensitization. And um, so there are three tests for this. Once again, there's the guinea pig maximization, also known as the magnesium Kligman method. So those are the two names for the guinea pig max. Um, local lymph node assay is a newer version of uh, the sensitization test. And then the Bueller method is very similar to the max, but it's the direct version, so the skin contact. I kind of wanted to tell you a little bit of what uh, sensitization is. Um, sensitization um, is uh, called delayed hypersensitivity, and, or type 4 hypersensitivity. 
The best way to explain it is a poison ivy. So if you're out in the woods and you contact poison ivy or poison oak, um, you actually will not have a reaction, but surprisingly enough. But your body develops helper T cells, those sensitizer cells, that remembers those, that poison from the uh, poison ivy, poison oak. So the next time you contact the plant, you break out. You become sensitized to that plant. That's what we look for here. You'll notice that the, max, the sensitization tests are the longer and most expensive tests. The reason why is they have three different phases, um, which is uh, we show here. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And so we have three different extraction periods. And then in this test, we also use a polar and nonpolar media. So like for the MEM elution test, we only use MEM fluid. So it's only one extraction. So we only need basically one sample to extract. But for the maximization, we have three different periods of testing, the induction one, induction two, and challenge phase. Each one has a polar and nonpolar media extraction. So we need six times the sample than we did for the MEM elution test. So that's important to think about. There's a lot of sample load for this test. So the induction one is we extract in a polar and nonpolar, and then we in inject into guinea pigs uh, your extraction. Indu and then induction two is it just repeat of that a couple weeks later. We extract, we inject in the same site. Then the challenge phase is once again we extract the samples, we, we, met, we wet a, a, a patch, and then put that on the extraction point. And we actually look for redness and swelling, the same reaction you get from poison ivy. The, obviously the disadvantage here is you are scoring this subjectively. A technician is looking about how much redness and swelling compared to a, a chart. So it's not uh, you know, great data as far as machines. Uh, it does take eight to nine weeks, so compared to three to four days or five days for the MEM, compared to eight to nine weeks, huge difference. And like I talked about, there's six times the sample needed than the cytotox. So this is the chart that we use to score redness and swelling, the same chart that we'll use for irritation test here in a minute. Um, and as you can see, it basically goes up into redness and swelling. So this first one here is we're either looking for slight redness or slight swelling. So you don't have both redness and swelling at this point. You're just kind of looking for either or. Um, and then two uh, is, is we move up the scale. We're seeing more redness and swelling. And then three is a huge amount of redness and swelling compared to the negative control. So uh, this is the range we go up, and they're scoring them with one, two, and three. Um, I just got a question about polar versus nonpolar. Are there separate, sample, separate samples used? And that is correct. So we're not allowed to re-extract a sample. So you can't take a sample, extract in cottonseed oil, and then extract in saline. Um, the reason why is because even though you might be looking for different extracts, uh, you could be um, you know, either changing the device or, or taking some leachables off and then not the other. So it's just very difficult to justify why you extract this device twice. I would never recommend extracting the same device twice. Uh, unfortunately, we would need six dist uh, distinct samples. So, um, so this is the scoring grade we look for. And obviously, the higher it goes, uh, the, the more sensitization happens. We do have an acceptance criteria validated for this test. And what we do is we score the animal for redness and swelling and compare that to the negative control. Uh, the negative control is just an animal that's been injected with the extract by itself. So there's not, there's not been a sample extracted in the media. It's just been injected with saline or cottonseed oil. And so we compare the redness and swelling from the test animal that has the extract with the test that's been extracted, the test sample, and then just the control. And then we basically uh, compare those two. And if the test sample is, is greater by one than the control animals, then you're considered a sensitizer. Um, the next test I'm going to talk about is a local lymph node assay. And even though this test is officially in the ISO standards, there's been some controversy with it lately, mostly with the Japanese regulatory agency, also with the metals. So um, be kind of cautious on running this test, even though personally I, I love this test. I would rather run this than the, the maximization. Um, that's not the case with some of the regulatories. 
the, the FDA would be fine except when it has to deal with metals. The reason why is because there's been some questions that metal ions are able to be sensitive to this test. So if you have metal in your product, don't think about it. Uh, the, the reason to think about running this test is look at the turnaround time. Uh, the other sensitization test is an eight to nine week test. This is only a four to six week test, so we're looking at about half the amount of time. So very, very quick. And what we do is instead of guinea pigs, we use mice. And these mice are genetically engineered that their lymph nodes in the back of their neck are engineered to that they'll mutate in the presence of a sensitizer. So we extract in DMSO, and, um, and DMSO is a very harsh, ex, uh, uh, you know, abrasive kind of media. And then so this would bring out any leachables, and then we put that in the back of the, the, the mice with saline as the other one. And then we, anything that are, is sensitizer will leach into the skin, into those lymph nodes. And then if there is a sensitizer in that extract that mutates that lymph node, that mutation allows for that lymph node to absorb radioactive material. Okay? And, and unfortunately, it doesn't become a super mouse like comic books would tell you. But what happens is this mutation allows the lymph nodes to then grab up that radioactive material. And then we can measure the amount of radioactive material in the lymph nodes. The more radioactive material in the lymph nodes, the, the more sensitization, sensitizers present in the extract. Okay, so that's the key. The more it's allowed to suck up radiation, those lymph nodes, the more sensitization is in the sample, the more sensitizers. So how we score it is we take the average radioactivity of the test um, divided by the average radioactivity of the control. And that gives you your stimulation index, just a really easy uh, average. So we let's say that the test gets, I don't know, like this easy 100, the, the control gets 100, you divide 100 by 100, you get a 1. And so that's how we get the stimulation index. Um, if you are 3 or less, you're, consider, you're fine, you pass. Anything over a 3 is considered a sensitizer. Technically a 3 or o, over, so 2.9 and less is fine. 3.0 and greater, you're considered a sensitizer. Um, so I had to set a question that says, did I hear correctly that the FDA accepts results in LNA um, as long as it doesn't have any metals? Um, that is correct. Um, up to this point, uh, I cannot promise you that's going to be the case forward, but every single LNA we've submitted to the FDA only without metals, just polymers, has been fine. So uh, we have seen metals rejected. So then also the question is what the, the typical cost um, and uh, for a sensitization test. It is quite expensive. Uh, we're looking anywhere in the range of $6,500 to $7,300 for that test. And that's why it's so important to be confident in the cytotoxicity test before you start the sensitization test, because you do not want to fail here also and then have to go investigate. So I had a, another question as far as metals go, as far as cations, you know, uh, sodium, calcium. Um, I would be cautious there also, uh, even though I haven't seen as big of impact with those metals, those well, the cations, um, it's potential there to be rejected also. If you have any questions, I would stick with the max, even though it's longer. It's a, by and large, a more regulatory safe test. So um, I give you an example right here of an LNA score, uh, where the average radioactivity of the test was 2,000, of the control was 1,500. Uh, the stimulation index is 1.3, so it was not a sensitizer. So um, the LNA is faster, like I said, but it's not recommended for metals, and the maximization is more common. So um, the next test we're going to talk about is the Bueller patch method. Um, this method is very similar to the MAX, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but um, uh, the um, the difference is instead of injecting an extract into the guinea pigs, we're actually just putting the sample itself onto the guinea pig skin. Once again, this is a direct version, so the sample's in direct contact with the animal. So we do nine inductions, three times per, uh, three inductions, three times for, for three weeks. So uh, for those uh, three weeks, we do nine inductions on the guinea pig, just basically repeating exposing, exposing to the guinea pig skin. This is usually like masks or gowns or things along those lines that have skin contact. Once again, the turnaround time is eight to nine weeks, um, and we need 100 one-inch by one-inch patches so that we can uh, basically cover the uh, uh, guinea pig. 
So um, the results here are very similar to the maximization. We, we, um, we score them, and then we look at grades of one or greater in the test group uh, compared to the negative control is considered a sensitizer. So um, that's basically very similar to how we score the, the, um, the maximization. Just the, really the only difference between the maximization and the Bueller method, instead of injecting an extract subdermally, this one we're putting the device directly onto the, the skin of the guinea pig. Um, the Bueller is cheaper than the Max because we're not in, uh, having two extractions and we can cut down on the amount of guinea pigs. Uh, and it is used over the max, once again, if your device only has skin contact. So it's the direct version. It's not an extraction for uh, body fluids. The last test we're going to talk about a little bit is the irritation test. And I mentioned about the sensitization being a type 4 hypersensitivity or the poison ivy reaction where you have to get multiple exposures. Um, the irritation looks for an immediate response. So this is something that contacts the skin or contacts the body and immediately causes the same redness and swelling. For this case, we don't do multiple exposures. That's why it's only four to five weeks instead of eight to nine weeks. And we only do one extraction time with a polar and nonpolar. So that's why there's, there's only twice as much sample necessary compared to the MEM and not six samples completed the sensitization because there's only one extract time with a polar and nonpolar instead of three extracts with a polar and nonpolar. The other benefit of the irritation test is we can get specific to the part of the body. Um, it, sorry, tur TAT means turnaround time, uh, just so you know. Uh, the specific, we can get very specific on this test to the part of the body that your device contacts. So if you contact the eye, we can do an ocular irritation. If you contact you know, some mucosal membrane, we can do a mucosal. So we can do a skin also. So there's different versions of this test depending on the type of contact your device has. The first one is the most common, and this is, has to deal with any kind of interior body contact, which is called an intercutaneous reactivity test. Um, what we do is we extract uh, the sample, once again, in polar and nonpolar, and then we inject uh, on the sides of the rabbits um, the extract. So very much like the sensitization test, but we do rabbits, and we don't do multiple in in injections, we do one. And then all we look is for the same resonance of swelling at 24, 48, and 72 hours after that injection time. So we score on that one, two, three scale. And then what we do to, to get a score here is we take the average of the score and divide it by 12. The reason we divide by 12 is there's two rabbits in the test. There's three observation periods, 24, 48, and 72 hours. And once again, there's two scoring categories. The, the um, uh, redness and swelling. So basically we're taking an average and then that average compared to the negative control average cannot be greater than one. So if you have a mean score of greater than one compared to the negative control, you're considered an irritant. So that's the test. Um, I'll stay on it just for a second. So you once again extract just once, inject just once, score it at 24, 48, and 72 hours, and then um, we look for redness and swelling and do the average of 12. So, uh, and that is a, for an immediate response. And that's important because a lot of people ask, well, if I'm doing a sensitization, do I have to do an irritation? Uh, yes, because they look at totally different um, immune system responses. So different, to totally different uh, body reaction. Um, so the last thing I'm going to hit, and uh, before we get to too many questions, I have about five minutes before we start accepting questions is what we do if, I f if we fail a test. And if, if you're going to do biocompatibility for a while, then you're uh, going to basically have a failure. So um, the, the I just had a question real fast on the irritation. It says, is the control injected in the same animals as the test sample? It is. Yeah, so one side of the animal is injected with the control extraction. One side, the other side of the animal is injected with the test. So there can be no differences between animal to animal and how they're responding to the device. So, um, so, in, so I deal a lot with failures. Uh, in fact, if you have a failure in one of the tests, you're probably going to be talking to me. Uh, and I developed this flow chart that um, I go through when I'm dealing with a failure from a customer on how we can either uh, you know, confirm the failure or accept it. So, uh, we're going to go through each one of these a little bit so that you can have some background. So if you do fail a test, then you know where to start and where to go. 
the first thing you want to do is confirm the procedure. Um, was the correct article tested? Was it made correctly? Um, there's a lot of time rush in these tests, and so a lot of times people will skip maybe stenosis or sterilization, or maybe they won't cure all the way the sample before they send it out. Or there's been times where uh, there's a, another company that's supposed to get an R&D sample, and we're supposed to get the test one, and they get shipped, changed in shipping, so we get an R&D sample instead. So the, make sure that the right test, right article was done. Was it clean and labeled and stored all the way? And uh, make sure the protocol is followed. And that's just not on your end. A good lab will help you investigate a failure um, to, to uh, make sure that the protocol is followed on the lab's end, too. Uh, so have them do an investigation. You do an investigation. This is just to make sure that the procedure was done correctly. And a lot of times when we fail a test, there be this will stop here. We'll con we'll confirm that the article was not made correctly, or something happened, and then just uh, you know make it a, a correct device and measure justification. If not, if we confirm the procedure, then we have to go to confirm results. So, uh, do repeat tests have the same result? This is a lot easier to do with the cytotox. Once again, it's a good thing that it fails nine times out of ten, because it's a cheap and quick test. If you fail the maximization, you might not want to do repeat tests because one repeat doesn't really tell you a lot. You can't just have one fail, one pass. That really doesn't tell you a lot as far as um, how your uh, device is going to be looked at regulatory-wise. So you have to do multiple repeats. Once again, with a very cheap test, that's easy to do. So do repeat tests have the same result? Are you confirming that there's something toxic in your sample? We can do a physical chemical profile. This is something that, with the new Dash 1 that's come out, um, that is more risk-based. This is something that, in Dash 18 and Dash 17, that we can look at. We can actually do a chemical profile and kind of get an idea of what might be on your sample, what might be coming off, and, and do some published literature searching, uh, some lot of history, to try to see what is toxic in your sample. So once we confirm that the procedure was followed and that we confirm that your sample is really toxic, the next thing we have to do is try to eliminate that toxicity. Now, sometimes this is easier said than done. Uh, if you have a finished device, uh, starting over again or replacing materials might sound difficult. Once again, another reason why you might want to look at doing some cytotox before the final device. But we can change the test procedure. Uh, let's say you believed that the direct contact was the right test for your device. It's skin contact only. But you wanted to be more conservative, so you went extraction version. Uh, well, maybe the auger overlay was the right test to run, and so you can do that to see if you pass, and then you have a justification of why that's the right test. Um, reformulate test article. This is something where you can look at maybe making it less concentrated in a certain area. Change a one lock type for a different lock type, for example. Change curing methods. Um, replace one material with another. Uh, these are some things you might want to look at. Maybe you're looking at three or four different vendors for the same material. And even though they swear to you they're the same material, someone might use a different mold release than someone else or different things in their manufacturing process. So if you separate out those materials with a cytotox and find out one fails, then you just eliminate that one from your final device um, opportunities. So, But let's say you can't eliminate the toxicity. And I think this is one that we don't explore a whole lot. There is potential to accept the toxicity. Uh, especially with the cytotoxicity test. Like I mentioned, the cytotox is very sensitive. Uh, latex is a perfect example. If you send in a latex glove, it's going to fail, and it's going to fail pretty bad. But latex gloves have been used in surgeries for years and years and years. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the, the sample is going to hurt someone. Uh, you might, most cases with cytotox, if you fail a cytotoxicity test, you're more looking at healing um, issues. So someone might, it might take longer for uh, a wound to heal than it would if it wasn't cytotoxic. But if you're looking at a device that is life-saving, then maybe that impact is, is, is worth the device. So you have to look at a risk assessment. Uh, check competitive material in use. Silver is a great antimicrobial. It also is toxic. So uh, check a device on the market with silver and do a, a, leech, or a dilution series on your device and then their device to see if you have the same endpoint. Do you have the same toxicity? And then you can basically uh, use their device as a way to get your device in the market. 
or you can label for safety. So um, this is way you might have seen some products that say might cause irritation if irritation persists more than 48 hours. Consult a physician or stop use. You know they might not have done so great on the irritation test. So um, that's just some of the things to think about. Um, I put some references in here. Uh, the USP 87 is the cytotoxicity test. USP 88 is the USP class 6 test, as we talked about before. So those are the two USP sections you can look at to look at the different tests. Um, and then uh, also here's a list of the ISO guidelines. Um, and I'll leave these on. I don't know if you are, are all aware of the different ISO, um, but these are the tests we talked about and, and some we didn't and the corresponding ISO guidelines. So at this point, um, Mike, do you, would you like to? Uh, thanks, Thor, for your insights today. Uh, we've all been um, educated greatly by your, by your presentation. Um, we're going to turn the time over to, to Thor to answer some of the questions that have been coming in. And, and there have been many, so we will try to get to as many as we possibly can. Again, I want to repeat um, that Thor will be available to also um, answer questions after the presentation and uh, anytime that you have them. He is available. His phone number is 801-290-7832 or by email at trollins at nelsonlabs.com. So I'll turn the time back over to Thor and uh, he'll be able to answer some of your questions. Thanks, Mike. I, what I'm going to do is just kind of go down the question list. Um, I'm, I'm willing to answer all of them. I don't know if you, if you need to leave. Feel fine. But I'll, I'll tell, ask the question that was here and then give the answer as best uh, I can. So um, the first question that we have uh, is, what about materials which absorb considerable amount of fluid and extract? And this is a great question. The ISO standard actually gives us an extraction um, method for absorbable materials. I mentioned before weight and surface area. Well, they give us also a different type of uh, extraction condition for absorbable materials. What we do is we usually do this by weight, and we take 0.2 grams per mil of extraction fluid, and uh, we actually saturate your sample with that fluid. So let's take saline, for example, and let's take uh, a sponge. We put a small amount of the sponge in there, and we saturate it with the, with the saline, and then we add our extraction on top of it. So we are taking in consideration that all the fluid is going through and making that surface area uncalculable, really. And so by that way, we can use this method. So there's a whole different method we use for uh, absorbent material. So if you have an absorbable device, uh, let us know. And if you know how much uh, th there actually is, it absorbs, if you let us know that also, that's great, because then we know how much to add to it um, and uh, be able to kind of add that much fluid to saturate it and then add our, our extraction on top of it. So good question. Uh, the next question I have is, is, when is chronic testing recommended? And this is a very tricky question. So the ISO 10993-1 gives you a chart, and the G95 uh, is the FDA's version of that chart. And really, the, this gives you the, the tests that are recommended for your type of contact. So a chronic test would be required for anything with prolonged exposure to the body that's not just skin. But that doesn't mean you have to run a chronic on every single one of those tests. For example, if your device is made out of stainless steel or titanium, chances are the questions aren't going to be about material because that material is well categorized. It's more on residual processing on that material. So. Um, you, in these cases, with materials that are well categorized and used, you, you have a better opportunity to justify out of the chronic tox test than you would with something that is not well categorized. So you should look at doing a chronic test, one, if your material is not used for your type of device in the past, or two, if you don't have really good assurance that, um, or history of use for that material. So um, and that, once again, really good question. So. Uh, the next question is, why do you need so much surface area, even for 120 centimeters, 20 mils of device? You will need 20 mils for a test. Is there any way that you could only need 10 mils for an MEM extraction solution? Um, this, this is, a, once again, correct. Um, by rule, it, with a six-well plate, we like to, 
to get about 20 mils just so that we cover if anything happens during the test. But for the silo test, we can actually get smaller well plates. Unlike the animal tests, we can't go grab smaller guinea pigs or rabbits. Um, well, we could, but it just wouldn't work. So uh, with the silo test, because it's an in vitro test, we can get smaller well plates. And we can actually get by with less media. So the 120 centimeter squared for 20 mils is a worst case. Uh, if your device is large and just one device would work. If you're dealing with like a stent or a cranial implant or something along those lines that are very small, we can get by with a lot less surface area. In fact, going down to a 24 well plate, we could get by with, depending on the thickness, you know, 20 or 30 centimeters squared. So uh, the whole re the reason I have 120 up there is, is to cover basically every scenario and it's a worst case. So, but for the animal test, we have much less wiggle room with the surface area requirements than we do with the MEM. Um, the next question is, what is the rea reliability of the MEM elution test? Um, once again, great question. This is really dependent on the technician running the test, in my opinion. Uh, the test itself is very reliable. I mean, if something is toxic, it's going to kill cells. Uh, you know, I mean, if there is a toxic material in your device, it will, it will kill cells. Now, in reality, cells can be different. The amount of capsaicin added to the extraction media can be different. Uh, for example, one test lab might add 10, 10 mil or 10 percent capsaicin compared to 5 percent. And if you have something that's, that's a, 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 like oil, then that, remember that capsaicin is a nonpolar, so it will draw off more of those leachables than a 5% would. So that would be more sensitive or less sensitive compared to your extracts. So um, also there are some changes or differences in, in well size, like I mentioned before. By rule, the bigger the well size, the more sensitive the test. Uh, cells like to feel enclosed. They, they feel more comfortable with less area. And so if you get down to a 24 well plate or even a 96 well plate, you'll get less sensitivity than you would with a six well plate. So there are differences between how you can run the test according to ISO and USP. You could run the test according to those guidelines and still follow within. Um, but it, it could have differences between the tests. But in reality, it all comes down to that technician scoring the percentages. Um, and that's why the, a new tests have come out uh, for the cytotox, which I don't talk about here because we just didn't have time. Uh, but if you're curious about the new test or MTT and XTT, that they have their disadvantages also, but uh, that could be a whole other webinar. Uh, but if you're curious about those tests, please contact me. I'm more than happy to go, go through it with you. So uh, the, the next question is, to what degree do USB class 6 ratings from a manufacturer substitute repeating the biocomp test for submission? Um, the USB class 6 tests include an intercutaneous reactivity, which we talked about, a systemic injection, which we didn't, and then a, a short-term implant, which again we didn't talk about. If your material, if you're not doing anything to that material, if you're just taking it and, and putting it into a package and, and sending it off, then you can use the, uh, those tests for your device. But if you're processing it in any way, sterilization, cleaning, um, manipulating it in any way besides just handling it, um, it would be difficult to substitute. Not impossible. I mean, there are always, always ways to look at justifying things. But in reality, it, just, it really is just a, a feel good about the material you're buying. And that's why I would also run or have them run or if you look for someone with a cytotox because, once again, you're, you're running a USB class 6. You're not even including the most sensitive test. So um, the next, te next question is, which tests are common to 1093 and USB Class 6? Um, you know, 1093, these big three right here are the most common. Um, and then systemic injection and material made of pyrogen are the next. Um, you know, we didn't talk about those. And I did mention the USB Class 6. So the USB Class 6 um, are a little bit different. They're not identical to the ISO. Um, so there are different extraction fluids and things. But they're similar tests. Uh, so your intercutaneous reactivity or the irritation is in the USB class 6. And then, like I said, they, they add a systemic injection and an in implantation to that. That's a USB class 6 combo. So um, the next question is, what is the red stain used in the cytotox? That's the neutral red. I mentioned that before. So uh, neutral red, viable stain, means healthy cells will bring it up. Uh, sick, sick cells will keep it away. So 
Um, the next question is, can you establish a worst case challenge for a device defining a maximum patient dose exposure? Yes. In fact, this is very common with types of devices that aren't strict metal or plastic. Um, even medical plastic, we can look at um, with a very small device, uh, you know, to even take a stent. Some people might not be able to get enough stents to get the surface area required to extract. I have seen a, a successful justification of taking like a 5 or 10x exposure, so 5 or 10 stents, and extracting those in the minim minimal amount of fluid needed to run the test and use it as a dose criteria. But the most, that, that's a little risky just to, with the justification, but not impossible. Like I said, I've seen it successful. But the most um, probable dose justification comes from uh, liquids or drugs or even maybe biodegradables, things like that, that will d um, turn it more into a dose type of device. So that's done by body weight um, compared to the animal's body weight and a 5x dose. So good question. Um, so the, the next one is how much serum in the MEM and does it matter? Uh, once again, we have 5%, which is actually in the standard, 5%, but it doesn't mean that you have to use 5%. Uh, like I said, I know labs use 10%. I would, if your lab is using more than 10% on extraction, I would uh, maybe ask why. 10% uh, I, I can still see as okay, but the, in reality, the more cough serum you add, the more non-polar the extract, which sounds good in theory, but the less polar the extract. So um, if you have something that comes off only in, in, in polar extractions, by incre increasing the nonpolar, you could be changing the sensitivity of that test. So, and you think 5% is not a whole lot, but when you're talking about the sensitivity of the cytotoxicity test, 5% can make a difference. So that is one of the things to look at when you're looking at the cytotoxicity test. Um, so, um, so the next question is, can you explain when you would use an auger overlay versus MEM elution on cytotox? Uh, this goes back to the direct and indirect uh, question. So if your sample is only skin contacting, so you only have skin contact, use the auger overlay. If you have fluid contact, then you want to use the MEM. Now that's the standard rule, but there's always kind of a variance. Uh, for example, um, if your sample will change and create some kind of um, you know, toxic material, uh, in the MEM. So with that extraction, it interacts with the MEM fluid bad and causes some kind of uh, toxic material just because it, of the MEM fluid itself, then you could have a good justification to go into the auger overlay. Um, the next question be, would be, why does Japan not like the LNA study? Uh, you know, I, I wish I had a better answer. Uh, the, L, the Japanese uh, uh, regulatory agency, JHMLW, is on the ISO guidelines with us. Um, they sign off on these, they comment, um, and in reality, my experience is depending on your reviewer there, um, if they'll accept it or not. Um, let's see, by rule though, if you have a question about going to Japan or even the FDA with your LNA, I would stick with the maximization, um, but uh, hopefully soon the Japan would uh, make, uh, you know, make it easier for you to get in with the LNA. Uh, and just to let you know, with metals, we are in the process of trying to j uh, validate metals with the LNA. So uh, we'll keep you updated if uh, we're able to have evidence for you that it's still a good test for metals. Does it, um, uh, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, I apologize. Um, but I'm more than happy to answer them. Like I said, after this seminar, uh, you can call me or uh, send me an email, whatever it would be. Um, uh, so the, the next question would be, uh, what is the purpose of having the second induction phase? Why not, and this is the sensitization test, why not just have initial induction phase and then the challenge? That's, that's a very good question. And in most cases, that actually would, would work in, in the, um, the biochemical reaction for a sensitization. A lot of those would only take one exposure. But in reality, um, some of these sensitization would it want the first up after the first multiple exposure, so the induction two phase, you would still get a redness and swelling reaction, but it would be a much smaller redness and swelling than it would on the challenge phase. So even though we would be able to get an indication on the on the sensitization reaction, it wouldn't be until the third exposure that we get a confirmation. 
So you would still probably be able to see something after the second in most cases, but the third one would probably be even worse. So that's why we do three phases to basically do a worst case. Um, and you know, some devices out there would have multiple exposures. Uh, I know a lot of people who have ir uh, sensitization reactions to the adhesive on Band-Aids. So they use a Band-Aid, uh, the same brand. The first time you use it, they don't have any reaction. It's just the second or third or fourth time they use it, all of a sudden they have redness where that adhesive is. Um, and uh, you know, that's just the buildup of that uh, sensitization reaction over time. So um, once again, I want to thank you for joining. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all the uh, questions, but I'm more than happy to try to answer anything you have. Uh, my contact information was given. Um, and uh, thank you for listening today. Thanks, Thor. And just uh, we have had some questions about uh, making the uh, slides available. We are we did record uh, this session, and they will be available on NelsonLabs.com. Um, that will be available here within the next couple of days. If you go to our Knowledge Center section, followed by the webinars, you will be able to find this information there as well. I just want to make a note: we our next webinar will be June 30th at the same time. It will be on how to tell if my device is really clean, and we look forward to, to doing these much more. We thank you for your time, and we hope you have a good day.